Welcome to the Brookhaven Instruments Learning Corner Series. I'm Daniel Seaman, Senior Scientist at Brookhaven Instruments. Today we're going to talk a little bit about DLS measurements made at high concentration. Specifically, we're going to talk about why this is a difficult problem to solve. So first, a little bit about particle size as determined by dynamic light scattering, or DLS. So freely diffusing particles move via Brownian motion. Brownian motion is thermal motion, so anytime you're at a temperature above absolute zero, absolute zero being zero Kelvin, anytime you're at any real temperature, you have thermal motion of particles in solution or suspension just due to thermal fluctuations. So just temperature-induced motion. Uh, so when we're doing sizing from dynamic light scattering, we're determining we're calculating a hydrodynamic size from this diffusive motion. Represented here is a large particle, so large particles move diffuse slowly. So large particle means slow diffusive motion. So as we can see here, for a 92 nanometer particle, it's comparable to a standard, uh, say, polystyrene latex particle, and seen diffusing at 25 degrees Celsius, so room temperature. You have a diffusion coefficient of about 5.3 times 10 to the negative eighth centimeter squared per second. So this corresponds to a displacement Per unit time. In contrast, if we look at the motion of a much smaller particle, a more rapidly diffusing particle, shown here a 20 nanometer particle, you can see much more rapid diffusion over the same time steps. And so in order to make sense out of this, we're just going to talk briefly about the Stokes-Einstein equation. So Stokes-Einstein is used to calculate a hydrodynamic size or diameter from a diffusion coefficient. So our d sub t is our translational diffusion coefficient. And then if you look in the denominator, you see hydrodynamic size, or a equivalent spherical diameter, d sub h. And some other terms such as eta, so eta is just uh, viscosity, uh, kt, Boltzmann constant times temperature. So the relation that we really want to remember here is that the translational diffusion coefficient is always going to be inversely proportional to your hydrodynamic particle size. So for an increasingly large series of hydrodynamic diameters, you would see increasingly small diffusion coefficients. So an increase in particle size means a decrease in diffusion coefficient and reduced diffusive motion. So it makes sense conceptually, large particles diffuse more slowly. So if you look on the left, you'll see diffusion coefficient. And if you look at our x-axis, we're looking at hydrodynamic size. And so you can see that as your particle size increases, your diffusion coefficient falls off rapidly, resulting in slower motion. Slower diffusive motion means a larger equivalent hydrodynamic size. Let's also briefly discuss equivalent spherical diameters. So what do I mean by equivalent? So just to start with, molecules do not need to be spherical in order to have an equivalent spherical diameter. So it's a little bit more simple when you're talking about colloidal particles, which are very close to spherical. So our 92 nanometer latex particle does in fact diffuse like a 92 nanometer sphere. And it's intuitive why it would do this, because it is a 92 nanometer sphere. Our 20 nanometer particle similarly would diffuse like a 20 nanometer sphere. So this raises the question, what about non-spherical molecules? So rod-like molecules, elongated molecules, flexible molecules, uh, what about them? Can a flexible polymer, for instance, still diffuse like a sphere? Can it still have an equivalent spherical diameter? The answer is yes, of course it can. This doesn't mean that it's spherical, but this means that it has the diffusion coefficient of a sphere of similar size to its calculated hydrodynamic size. So it's relating its hydrodynamic motion to its size via an equivalency based on an assumed geometry. That does not mean that your flexible polymer is a sphere, but it means that it's diffusing like a sphere, a sphere of a known size. So just took a little bit more about our, uh, a little bit more about flexible polymers. So they're of course, extremely non-spherical. They undergo random motion and solution. 
uh, but they also undergo internal motion and they're highly flexible. And so a flexible polymer still has a measurable diffusion coefficient due to its center of mass translation, its motion in solution, which would be equivalent to its hydrodynamic size. Uh, for many polymer solutions, it's also common to see other diffusive modes. These could be due to internal motion of polymer chains or clustering. So just to recap, our particle size as measured by dynamic light scattering is derived from Brownian motion. Small particles diffuse more rapidly, meaning they have a larger diffusion coefficient. Large particles diffuse more slowly. And in all cases, our hydrodynamic size is equivalent to a spherical diameter. And this spherical diameter is always inversely proportional to our diffusion coefficient. Okay, so now we're going to talk about our case study. So polymer solutions at high concentration. Uh, so how do we define high concentration? So high volume fraction, high weight percent solids, uh, credit solutions. There are numerous terms that refer to high concentration solutions, suspensions, dispersions. What all of these have in common is that they're actually defined by what they're not. In other words, that they are not dilute. So when we talk about the dilute limit, what do we actually mean? The dilute limit is just a, uh, it's a concentration, represents a concentration regime where particles tend to behave ideally. So you don't have interactions, you don't have interactions between multiple particles, you, things don't deviate for very far from theoretical predictions, and so most of the models used to calculate things like size and Brownian motion uh, hold up pretty well. So of course, as you can tell from the name, the dilute limit is a limiting condition, so it's a theoretical limit. You can't really make any actual measurements at a limiting condition. So our two polymers are both flexible polymers of moderate chain length, so between 150 and 300 repeats. Um, PVP, or polyvinyl perlidone, is a neutral polymer, and thus we would expect to see weak interparticle interactions. It's a flexible chain, does not have any fixed permanent charges. Contrast, sodium polystyrene sulfonate is a polyelectrolyte, so it has a very high linear charge density and strong inter and intraparticle interactions, especially at low salt, where you have insufficient ionic strength to screen electrostatic interactions both between chains and within chains. So for sodium polystyrene sulfonate, uh, we would expect to see more intense interparticle interactions relative to PVP. Okay, so ideally, we would want to measure at infinite dilution. As we already discussed, there's no possible measurement to make at infinite dilution. So if we're at infinite dilution, we're at zero grams per liter polymer. If you have zero grams per liter, if you have no polymer molecules, there's nothing to measure, there's no properties. You can't measure the property of a zero concentration solution. Uh, so what we really want to get at, get at in infinite dilution is this idea of a single molecule property. We want to see scattering due to a single molecule. Of course, to make a measurement of a solution that only contained a single, single molecule or a single particle or a single polymer chain, we'd have non-existent signal to noise. We'd never be able to make a measurement. So what now? Any good polymer chemist, we extrapolate. So shown here, we're doing a serial dilution, so starting from high concentration, each concentration successfully lower, successively lower than the last. And by doing this, you're able to extrapolate your diffusion coefficient measurement uh, to the limit of zero concentration. And so you go, start in the concentrated end, you go to your, inf you start in your infinitely, your insufficiently dilute condition, then semi-dilute, and then you keep extrapolating down to the dilute limit. And so here Cp is concentration of polymer. So before we examine the results of our serial dilution, note that 
even in dilute solution conditions, both samples appear bimodal. And here we use bimodal to mean that there are two peaks present. And so as you may recall from earlier, polymer solutions often show multiple modes of diffusion, multiple detectable modes of diffusion. So our fast mode, or our more fastly diffusing equivalent species, we take as our hydrodynamic size, and it represents the size of a single polymer chain uh, on the order of 10 nanometers for both polymers. We attribute our slow mode, our more slowly diffusing mode, uh, to clustering, to the clustering of multiple polymer chains. So now we look at the results of our serial dilution. So we're starting from 50 mg per ml on the right and extrapolating down to one mg per ml. So as you can see, you see a fast mode and a slow mode for both samples. So we take our fast mode to refer to the size of a single particle and note that it becomes slower on dilution. So our slow mode becomes slower as we move to the dilute limit. And so as we approach dilute solution conditions, the apparent hydrodynamic size of both polymer chains increases relative to its initial size at high concentration. Uh, also note that our slow mode, shown on the bottom for both samples, becomes more rapid, so it looks smaller and smaller, so that our cluster looks smaller and smaller, right up until we reach a concentration of polymer equivalent to, or on the order of, the overlap concentration, or C star. And so what's going on here? What's actually causing this? So we're, we frame this as though it's a case study in polymer solutions at high concentration, but what we're really dealing with here, what we're really looking at, is, are the effects of multiple scattering and interparticle interactions, both of which become harder to ignore at high concentration. So multiple scattering makes sizes appear too small. This applies to both the fast and slow modes. So note the fast mode uh, gets slower upon dilution. The slow mode also gets slower upon dilution, but only when you're below uh, the, the overlap concentration of each polymer chain. Interparticle interactions, on the other hand, so in this case, attractive interactions between polymer chains resulting in clustering, uh, cause this particle size to appear larger at high concentration, which we call clustering. Uh, so note that upon dilution, this, this slow mode becomes faster and faster, meaning its apparent size is getting smaller and smaller. You can imagine your, your clusters are getting smaller and smaller as you move closer to the dilute limit. So I know I just said multiple scattering causes measured sizes to appear too small at high concentration. So you're probably asking why. So as you may recall from earlier, uh, from the Stokes-Einstein equation, so d sub h is calculated from the translational diffusion coefficient. Our diffusion coefficient is inversely proportional to our hydrodynamic particle size, but our diffusion coefficient itself depends on a decay rate gamma. This decay rate relates to the particle's thermal motion to its diffusion coefficient. And so this, this decay rate is actually our primary measurement. Uh, so in the case of multiple scattering, this decay rate gamma appears too rapid. And so you, the, the decay rate for multiple scattering is much larger than the actual decay rate if it were resulting from a single particle. And thus our diffusion coefficient appears too large and our hydrodynamic size appears too small. And thus for multiply scattering systems, calculated sizes always appear too small. I still haven't quite gotten to the physical phenomena that causes this. And so I've said what effect multiple scattering has, but I haven't said what multiple scattering itself actually is. So it's actually very simple. It's when you have too many particles in a beam path. So too many particles, too high a concentration, too many particles, and then the same photon has the opportunity to scatter multiple times before hitting the detector. And so the original scattering event is no longer correlated to the scattering event, at, or is no longer correlated to the photon that hits the detector. So it's just this more rapid loss of correlation.
due to an excessive number of particles in the beam path. So this represent, is represented as an artificially fast loss of correlation or an artificially rapidly decaying correlation function. And the net result is that it makes particles look too small and it does so systematically. So now on to our second issue, so interparticle interactions. So this sounds like it should actually be the more simple of the two problems. Uh, and yet the fact that there are so many different types of interactions possible between particles, and it depends on surface chemistry, depends on electrostatics, it depends on physics, it depends on regime of sizes and concentrations. So it's actually a much more complicated phenomenon to predict. And yet the fact that it exists is a bit more intuitive. So when you go to high volume fraction, particles are too close together. So the separation between particles becomes smaller and smaller at high concentrations. So whereas in dilute solution conditions, long range repulsions keeps particles far apart, high concentrations, this separation is no longer possible. So if we once again recall our friend the Stokes-Einstein equation, so remember that diffusion coefficient is inversely proportional to particle size, as well as a coefficient that describes some other terms due to the shape or form of the particle. But this only holds when this diffusion coefficient, or d sub t, is the translational diffusion coefficient of a single particle. And so you can see that as you go to high concentrations, this is no longer the case. And so instead of measuring a translational diffusion coefficient, a d sub t, we're now measuring a mutual diffusion coefficient d sub m. So the thing to remember here is that your diffusion coefficient is now going to depend on concentration. And you see our relatively simple term before is now replaced by a function that depends at the very least on concentration and on particle size. And so you can no longer decouple the motion of multiple particles. Thus you should never use this mutual diffusion coefficient to calculate a particle size. It may appear too large or too small, depending on the type of interaction. So if you look at attractive interactions, if you have, say, oppositely charged particles, they interact attractively. They will diffuse cooperatively, so their motions are now coupled in an attractive sense. In the case of, it, in the, in the case of a strong attractive interaction, particles actually may interact irreversibly you might simply form a larger particle composed of smaller uh, subcomponents, in which case it's intuitive that this attractive interaction leads to a larger effective particle size. It gets a little bit more complicated in the case of strongly repulsive particles. At lower or intermediate concentrations, they may appear to diffuse more rapidly. Uh, they may behave as though they are caged or constrained when pushed to extremely high concentrations thing to remember is in either case, you don't want to be using a mutual diffusion coefficient to calculate a particle size. So since we are dealing with polymer solutions here, the overlap concentration, or C star, uh, denotes the point at which you transition from dilute to semi-dilute concentration regimes. So your, your overlap concentration, your C star, is going to be controlled by both the molecular weight and chain length of your polymer, as well as its radius of gyration. And so it's a way of relating the size of the molecule to the effective size that it occupies in solution. You can see that for a single chain, you have no interactions. As long as you're in dilute solution conditions, you imagine you have isolated chains. They're not interacting with each other. And then as you approach the semi-dilute concentration regime, so as you approach CP, so concentration of polymer equal to C star, you have your first interaction or your first overlap between chains. As you go to your highest concentrations, you have multiple points of interaction between polymer chains. You have a crowded solution filled with, with multiply overlapping space filling polymer solutions. And so this becomes a bit of a mess from a dynamic light scattering standpoint. So we always prefer to work in the dilute limit, especially if you're going to try to measure the size of a single polymer chain, you want to be dilute. And so you, we're talking about interparticle interactions in polymer solutions. It mostly makes sense to talk about this when we are above C star. What are our challenges for measuring polymer solutions at high concentration? 
So at high concentration, the hydrodynamic size appears too small because of multiple scattering. At concentrations above the overlap concentration, or C star, interparticle interactions cause the molecule to fuse as though it were larger. So we call this clustering. So if you look your fast mode, as you go to high concentration, at high concentrations, your fast mode becomes too fast and your slow mode becomes too slow. So by extrapolating to the dilute limit, we are able to make a measurement that is actually representative of the particle's true size. Once again, our recap of challenges measuring a size at high concentrations. So multiple scattering makes particles appear too small. Tractive interparticle interactions can make sizes appear too large, resulting from slower diffusion. And in either case, measuring particle size requires serial dilution and extrapolation to lower concentrations. For more information, please be sure to subscribe to our Learning Corner series. You can contact us at learningcorner at brookhaveninstruments.com. You can also request the full text of our application note, as well as reach out to us with any other questions that you may have.